appreciate you so much. Um, get a little situated here. Oh, it's such a privilege to be able to serve this congregation. I really appreciate you guys so much. I'm really looking forward to our uh, I'm really looking forward to our Trunk or Treat outreach. It's going to be a great time. Uh, I'm really excited because as I've been traveling around town asking people if we can put up a poster, uh, when I first got here, all of the places that I'm currently going, uh, I would talk to them and they would be like, oh, so what brings you to Silver City? And I'm like, well, I'm a pastor. And apparently, right around the same time, there was a whole rash of pastors dying. Uh, and they asked me, oh, that's super cool. You're a pastor. What church do you pastor? And I'd say, oh, I'm the pastor of the door. And they go, oh, that church. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so it's been four months of me kind of just building relationships with people and, and you know what the best way to build a relationship with somebody like the owner of the Toad is? You buy burgers. <laughs> you go and spend money, and then people like you. <laughs> Jesus said, if you make for yourself friends with unrighteous mammon, when everything else fails, they'll receive you. Right? So, so I went and I bought some burgers and some french fries, and, and now we have a poster hanging up in their window. And uh, so I'm very excited because... God has really opened doors to make ways and build new relationships with business owners, with, uh, with uh, uh, other people, and I'm just really excited to see what God's going to do through this outreach. Uh, so we have a meeting for that right after service. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 6. You know, some people are creatives. Their brain's always running, man. They're building stories, they're painting pictures, they're, they're sculpting. Uh, all of these things are happening in their mind a million miles an hour, uh, and usually weeks or even months before they actually happen on paper. Now, I'm one of those people. I'm constantly writing screenplays in my mind, I'm constantly thinking of scenes that we could film. I'm constantly thinking of music video ideas. And they're, they're all, my brain is always a million miles an hour with my hair on fire. Uh, but sometimes I have to catch my family up on my thoughts. Okay? Because sometimes my mind works so fast that I'm like, here's an example. I might see a guy on the subway. The way he walks reminds me of somebody that I used to know. This, the dude I used to know reminds me of a restaurant that we used to eat at together, which reminds me of my favorite thing to eat there, which reminds me of a book that I read where the main character eats my favorite dish from this restaurant, which leads me to turn to my wife and go, they should make that a movie. <laughs> and then she goes, they should make what a movie? I have to realize that nobody else lives in my head with me. <laughs> that my brain is running, and I have to back up and explain the whole thought process. She can explain what the heck up. She understands what the heck I'm talking about. Authors, songwriters, script writers, they all suffer from a similar condition. Inspiration comes at the weirdest moments. Three o'clock in the morning, you wake up and go, that's a great idea. The problem is you're never going to remember it unless you write it down. But this is why I tell everybody that a good disciple will always have a pen. Take notes, disciples. Mm -hmm. If you're a good disciple, you will always have a pen. Because you never know when the Holy Spirit's going to inspire you. Amen. But here's the thing about inspiration. Inspiration is just the beginning. And there's nothing more rewarding than stepping back from a finished work and going, I did that. That's, it's done. That play is done. That skit is done. That sermon is done. That movie is done. 
But there's a huge gap between the moment of inspiration and the moment of completion. And creative people have given it a name. They call it the messy middle. Because the messy middle is ugly. And it's gross. And it requires discipline. And nobody wants to go through the middle to get to the end. They want to skip from inspiration to completion. Let's read Philippians 1, 3 through 6. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I want to talk this evening about the messy middle, the actual act of Jesus completing the work that he has begun in you. What's that look like? Let's talk about the beginning. Our scripture says, he who began a good work in you. Well, John 6.44 says, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It's no accident that you're here today. Amen. You're here because the Father who sent Jesus drew you. If you've already made a decision to follow Jesus, praise God, congratulations. If you haven't, you can tonight, a little later. Many people have great intentions at the beginning because the beginning is easy. In Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4, we see that Lot decided to follow Abraham. It says, The Lord said to Abram, Go from your father's country and from your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse and all in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. The beginning is the easy part. All you've got to do in the beginning is respond. Wow, that's a great idea. I want to do that. That's easy. Yes, I want to be a part of that. Yes, I need to change. Yes, I want what they have. I want that self-driving Tesla. <laughs> the beginning is easy. Let's talk a little about the end. Well, no, let's talk about the middle. We'll talk about the end in a second. There was a song released in 1972 by the band Steeler's Wheel. And the lyrics go like this, trying to make some sense of it all, but I can see it makes no sense at all. Uh, is it cool to go sleep on the floor? Because I don't think I can take any more. Clowns to the left of me, jokers to the right. Here I am, stuck in the middle with you. So if we're here, we've already established you are called by God. You've been called. That's why you're here. We will all be completed when Jesus returns. But for now, here I am, stuck in the middle with you. Philippians 1, 3 through 6 again says, I thank God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, because uh, of making uh, all prayer, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. The gospel of Jesus is a partnership. Our church is a partnership. This life is a partnership. We've got to help ourselves get through the messy middle. Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22 says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, 
grows into a holy temple, and in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place, place for God by the Spirit. God's destiny for your life does not stop at the moment you decided to come to church. That's like the moment of inspiration. Wow. Done. We're citizens. And citizens have responsibilities and loyalties. There are laws that we have to abide by because of our citizenship. At the moment of our salvation, our citizenship changed. We're no longer Americans. We're no longer Colombians, Irish, Mexicans. We've become citizens of heaven. Amen. We're not from here. We're just passing through. But are the decisions that we are making giving our king and our country a good name or a bad one? Lot wanted to be associated with his uncle Abraham. He wanted his citizenship to change, but he wasn't willing to pay the price to receive it. Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and eventually moved his tent as far as Sodom. We can see Lot making a series of decisions to creep ever closer to Sodom ever further from the decision to follow God. Can I tell you, I'm going to tell you a secret that I discovered. When I was in China, China has the world's longest escalators. They're stupid long, man. Like, you get on the escalator and you can't even see the bottom of the escalator. And it just keeps going down, down, down. <laughs> So my son and I, being boys, decided that we were going to run up one of these down escalators. Now, I don't know if you've ever run up a down escalator. It's, well, down and up escalators is easy because gravity is helping. Okay, you just, all you got to do is fall and you make it down and up escalator. But running up a down escalator is like, especially these like mile long escalators, you get about a third of the way and you're like, oh my God, oh my God. And you stop, and, and you stop to rest. You're like, two seconds. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. And in that two seconds, you lose 40 feet. And you're like, oh my God, I'm never gonna make it. <laughs> I'll take the Pepsi challenge against any marathon runner. Yeah, it's terrible. But life is like a down escalator. If you're not constantly running toward Jesus, you are slowly drifting away from him. <laughs> our decisions will shape our destiny. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16 says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried around by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, namely into Christ, for whom the whole body joined and held together, every joint with which it is equipped, and each part working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So how are we supposed to grow up into Christ? You know the word Christian means little Christ? That's what it means. So when we speak to people, are we really showing people Jesus? How are we supposed to become more like Jesus? Well, Paul continues in Ephesians. He says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, 
greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on your new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I'm going to pause right there. You know, my dad used to say, fake it till you make it. He would say, dude, if you don't know what to do, just look at the people around you, do what they're doing until you figure out what to do, until it becomes part of you. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Now, these are simple things. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry, but do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. To the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him work, doing honest labor with his own hands that he may have something to share with everyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion that gives grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, <laughs> tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That's a huge laundry list that really boils down to the process of becoming more like Jesus is made of a thousand tiny decisions every day. Tiny decisions. Am I going to be angry? Am I going to sin? So what's the difference between being angry and sinning? Anger is an emotion. You can't help it. You have five basic human emotions. Every culture all around the world shares those five basic human emotions. If you've ever seen Inside Out, you know them. It's true. That was a psychological movie. Okay, uh, You've got anger, fear, sadness, um, disgust, and joy. And those are universal emotions. We are going to feel anger. But are we going to lash out with our mouth? Are we going to lash out in slander? When we're angry, are we going to go tell somebody, Oh, bro, that dude, man. Can't believe what they did. Or are we going to forgive? Are we going to go, whether they meant it or not is irrelevant. Whether it was intentional or not is irrelevant. Jesus forgave me a debt I could not pay. So it's only right for me to forgive them this little thing no matter how big that little thing actually is. It's a simple thing. Work hard instead of stealing stuff. Be honest instead of lying. When you speak, take care that what you're saying is building people up instead of tearing them down. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Be kind. Be tender-hearted. Forgive. Our scripture says that we should put off the old self and put on the new self. How many of you used to watch Mr. Rogers when you were kids? That was my favorite show. My favorite show. I loved the little field trips where I'd learn how to make crayons. You know, like I'm, like I'm never, ever, ever going to need this knowledge. Not ever in my life. But it was fascinating to me to watch these giant machines building like colored pencils and things. I was just like, wow. <laughs> But the part that I always wanted to skip was the beginning and the end when he walks in and he's like, 
Such a good feeling to know you're alive. He takes off his shoe and throws it from one hand to the other and puts it down. And it was always the same opening, right? But he's taking off his outside clothes. I mean, this is a very New England thing, right? Because in Wyoming, you don't take off your outside clothes and put on your inside clothes. There's no inside shoes. We had one pair of shoes. So I thought, this is weird, man. But at the same time, when I read this scripture, I thought, that's really as easy as it is. I walk into the house of God, and I go, okay, God, what do I need to get rid of? Lying. Such a good feeling to know you're alive. <laughs> Stop lying, Corey. All right, I'll put on honesty instead. You know, we're all going to finish. We're all rampaging toward the finish line, whether we like it or not. The end is near, and whether we, we like it or not, we have to face the reality that Jesus is coming very soon. All this stuff that's happening in Jerusalem, it's a fulfillment of biblical prophecy, and it's way more spiritual than we understand. The Bible says in Revelation, this isn't even in my notes, you get it for free. Uh, the Bible says in Revelation that the dragon stood ready to make war against the woman and her child and his offspring. That from the beginning of time, Satan has been preparing for this moment. This is not just another war. The war against the Jews is the war against the church, is the war against Jesus himself. We also have to face the fact that many people who start well don't finish well. I'll give you three examples from the Bible. Lot, who went with Abraham, Solomon the king, and Judas Iscariot. Now Jesus promises to complete the work that he began in us until the day of Christ. That's when he returns. When is that? We don't know. How do we know when our fight is over? Well, 1 Thessalonians says, We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep that you may grieve as others who have no hope. But since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring, him, uh, will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, the voice of an archangel and the sound of a trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Jesus is coming back soon. Amen. I have another sermon that I'm preparing on, on biblical prophecy, and I'll show you some pictures. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 17, Isaiah issues this scathing prophecy against the city of Damascus and says, Damascus will no longer be a city, it'll be a heap of ruins. Damascus is the oldest occupied city in the world. In the history of the world, it's been around for about 6,000 years. In its history, it has been surrounded by armies three times. It has suffered exactly zero damage. Through its history, through its history, it has never been damaged because the kings of Damascus always peacefully surrender. That is until last year when ISIS started a civil war and reduced the city for the first time in its history to rubble. Fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 17. We are so close to the return of Christ. And this is not something that you're going to miss. You're not going to miss a third of the world's population vanishing 
like Bono's snap. We're going to join all the Christians who have died before us, generations and generations and generations of people. It's not an event the world will overlook. I don't think it's going to be like your wife getting a haircut. Where three days afterwards, she's like, did you notice anything different? <laughs> It's not like we're going to be walking to people who are left behind or walking down the street going, wait, where are all the people from that church? Like it's, people are going to notice that millions of people dramatically leave. But until Jesus comes back, here I am, stuck in the middle with you. We got a lot of life ahead of us. We have a happy ending if we finish well. Lot did not finish well. He started well, but he didn't finish well. Lot's life ends in tragedy. He moves into this incredibly sinful city that's overrun with homosexuality. When two angels come to rescue him from the city before they destroy it, he offers his two virgin daughters to a mob of homosexual men who are trying to rape the angels. His wife loves the city so much that she disobeys God, be it one last look at the city, and is turned into a pillar of salt. Left alone with his daughters, his daughters were so corrupted by the sin of the city and by the perversion of the city that they get their own father drunk and commit incest because God knows there are no other men anywhere else. And they're so afraid that they won't get married. But what, what led to Lot's terrible end? A million decisions he made before then. What led to Solomon's bad end? Because Solomon didn't end well either, but he ended poorly for a whole different reason. First Kings says Solomon had 700 wives. First mistake. 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for it was so that when Solomon was old, his wives had turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not loyal to the Lord God, as was the heart of his father's father David. Bad relationships can kill your end. What about Judas? <coughs> Judas, at one point... This woman is anointing Jesus for burial, and he complains, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief, and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Covetous love of money led to Judas's bad end. A thousand tiny decisions. Will affect the end. Creative people call it the messy middle. It's the discipline of actions, the discipline of just getting the work done so that the end will actually justify the means. All that discipline is necessary to come to a good end. How many of you want a good end tonight? Amen? we got a lot of life to live before Jesus comes back. Let's make the decisions he would want us to make. Let's make the decisions that are fitting for him, that help us grow into Christ. Let's make those decisions. Let's bow our heads this evening. If you're here tonight and you haven't made the decision to submit yourself to Jesus, to say, God, I know I'm a sinner, and I need your forgiveness. If you haven't made that decision, you know you're separated from God right now. You know that if you were to die tonight or if Jesus were to come back tonight, you're not sure that you would make heaven your home. If that's you, what I want you to do is just do something really quickly as a symbol to God. I want to pray for you. Just raise your hand and put it right back down. And who else? 
You're not sure you'd make heaven your home if you were to slip into eternity tonight. Maybe you once knew the love of God. You once walked with Jesus. But you find yourself distant from him. You find yourself far away. And you're overrun with the guilt of your decisions. You're eaten up with anger. You're eaten up with bitterness. You're eaten up with resentment. You say, Pastor, you don't understand what was done to me. Maybe I don't. But Jesus does. And Jesus can deliver you from that anger. Jesus can save you from that hate. Jesus can save you if you just give it to him. Raise your hand tonight. I want to pray for you. Amen. We're going to open these altars. I'm going to change the call. You're here tonight and you've had a good start, but now there's a discipline. Now there are decisions that you have to make. Now there are decisions that are standing before you that will either lead you toward Jesus or pull you away from him. By being on that down escalator, if you are not constantly making decisions that are pressing you forward, you are slowly drifting backwards. We're going to open these altars. I challenge you to come and make some commitments to God this evening. Let's sing this song. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing this song. Thank you.